Hello and welcome to Talk of Gamers Match Preview. West Ham United against Manchester United. Gonzo, can you kick us off with your thoughts on the Red Devils, please? Yeah, I guess a club uh, in transition. Seems like they've been in that for a long time. Quite possibly the Man U fans are getting their way uh, with the the Glazers possibly easing their way out, but it's not going to be quick. It does seem like the death of, of a thousand cuts. Uh, Sir Jim Ratcliffe's got himself in there, uh, got a percentage of the club. Um, I think he is stipulated that he is going to run the football operations uh, with there. So uh, he's certainly uh, appointing uh, some people to the board as well. Uh, I think they're, um, they're getting rid of their old, um, the guy that used to run, you know, a lot of the commercial side for, uh, for and the football operations. He's going to put his own guy in there who's worked with him before, which I think is possibly going to help. As I understand it, he may well be looking to shoehorn a new coaching team in there sort of sooner rather than later. And there's there's lots to be done at that club. I, I think that the roof is is leaking. <laughs> we know that one. Uh, the roof's leaking there at the stadium. Uh, apparently, they, um, a, lot of, a lot of the infrastructure is... Um, well, whilst it might have been a lot of the stuff might have been state of the art twenty five years ago, uh, it's not the case anymore. So they they need to sort of get get busy on that. Uh, as you know, I've I've never been convinced on the manager not from not from day one, um, and uh, and I think that's probably going to continue. And I think now you've probably got a situation where quite possibly um, the new guy coming in in in, in Ratcliffe is going to feel the same. I just look, it's been a struggle since since Alec Ferguson left and I don't see really much difference between any of the managers that have that have been there um they all seem to have produced a similar outcome we with the maybe possibly with the exception of Jose but that went he won the European trophy didn't he but it went sour very quickly after the first season as it always seems to do uh, with Jose Mourinho these days so yeah I think a club in transition yeah, like you said, they've been probably in transition since Sir Alex, but you don't really know where they're going. It's like, what, what, what is the direction? I mean, they keep changing direction, keep changing managers. Nothing's working. Maybe a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel with a potential change of ownership, or only part of the ownership is changing. But hopefully, for Man United fans, that would be significant change, something they've been wanting for quite some time now as well. So off the pitch, it might be getting better. But on the pitch, I mean... I think if any fans of other clubs can relate to West Ham fans when we say that the results are okay, but the football is not particularly great, it's possibly Man United fans this season, actually, because when I watch them, they're not good to watch, and it feels like they're just grinding out results. They're picking up wins, and I'm not sure how they're picking up the wins because it's far from convincing. It's far from obvious what the game plan is or what the tactics are, Um, but it's yielded... A decent enough set of results in the Premier League. Obviously, going out in the Champions League, out altogether of European football was a bit embarrassing on their part as well. Obviously, they had a big call to make in the summer by letting De Gea's contract run out and letting him go and then bringing Onana in. That hasn't worked out whatsoever. And I think when you get big calls like that wrong as a football club and as a manager, I think sometimes it can be fatal where if you make a huge decision, which... I wouldn't say controversial. I think a lot of Man United fans wanted to see De Gea upgraded because he felt that he wasn't the goalkeeper to play the way that Ten Hag plays. And I would make him right. I don't think he was. But if managed to bring in a keeper that might be more comfortable with the ball at his feet, but he's left comfortable with his hands. Um, <laughs> and I think when it comes to goalkeeping, I, I don't think that's the wisest decision that they've ever made. Now, I liked Onana when he was at Ajax. I thought he was a really good goalkeeper. And I felt in the summer... I hadn't seen him post Ajax. I felt it was like a reasonably good signing for them. I thought he'd do quite well there, actually. I've been surprised at how poor he's been. I don't think it's all his fault. And it's becoming a little bit meme-worthy. But let's be honest. If we were to sort of tier list the 20 go- first number one goalkeepers in the Premier League as to how they performed this season, you'd put him at the bottom and start to work out who's actually been worse than him and deserves to be 20th. And I'm not sure there's that many candidates, truth be told. Um, anyway, Ten how you alluded to it there. You're not being convinced on him and you hinted that you think there might perhaps be change on the horizon in a managerial position. He seems to be under pressure from day dot. I mean, he won manager of the month for October, for, for November, maybe October, whatever. He won manager of the month, Ganacho won goal of the month, Maguire won player of the month. Man United had a, the treble, if you like, that uh, that particular period. But I've never known a manager to be under so much pressure, yet win manager of the month. No, I mean, I, I think the thing is perhaps the perception of how 
badly they were doing wasn't matched by how they were actually doing, which was, but they was, I think possibly when you get man, managing them up, they're just looking at results. Uh, I think a lot of and those. And Premier League form only, so they exclude Champions League. Yeah, and he was scraping through a few of those games, wasn't he? So I think, you know, were they swashbuckling? No. Um, and also because he's constantly under pressure as well, that makes you maybe think, oh, he can't win manager of the month. And, and there's obviously stuff going on within the team. So if you start to scratch below the surface, it's hard to understand it. But if you are literally just looking at the raw data of how many points have been accrued over a period of time, then he wins He wins manager at a month. But how well is he managing everybody? How motivated are the players? How good are his tactics? Th- th- those things aren't taken into consideration. So um, I'm sure Manchester United fans will be able to tell us a lot more about uh, that, that sort of thing. As, as we know with West Ham, there's going to be players that are not part of the team at the moment that maybe should be included. Players that were previously ostracised or now been brought back into the fold. So you've clearly got this whole fluid thing going on, which unless you're part of the club, you're probably you're probably not going to know. In the same way that someone might say to West Ham, oh, you know what, that um, that's Sai Ben Rama, he's a decent player, right? Surely uh, he'll get in the team, he can create a few things for you down the left. You might have that perception from outside, but you talk to a West Ham fan and we say, oh, oh no, no, let me tell you what's really going on here. So I think there's a lot of that going on at Man U that I, I certainly wouldn't be privy to myself. So do you think Ten Hag should be dismissed? Um... I don't think he's any better than Ole Gunnar Solskjaer uh, at the moment for Man U. I'm not saying, um, I don't know, weird. A lot of that IX team that he had have, have turned out to be a bit crap, actually. Um, it has, has to be said. You look at that IX team that he had that did really well, um, have not turned out to be quite quite so good, actually. And, and I think he I think there's a he managed to get the very best out of that group of players whilst the IX um, possibly quite different to managing a full squad at somebody like Man United and, and you just well, the expectations are so much higher on a global scale clearly Ajax are supposed to win the Eredivisie, that, that's that's clear um, but it's very very different, they're not on massive wages the moment you sign for Manchester United you become a superstar and uh, and you sort of look at you know, be it Anana, um, you know, be it Anthony, uh, you know, the moment you put them in that arena do they do they grow or, or do they shrink? And I, and I just think the fact that a player might have done well for him at a previous club is is probably no barometer. I've heard it so many times. I've heard Rio then talk about it about players shrinking when they go to Man United because the pressure. It, it, I mean, it is a huge as, as much as the roof might be leaking. It is a monstrous club, and you you know that when you go there, when you go and visit them uh, for an on away game and whatnot. It is a monstrous football club, and and I think they they pretty much do pack out the stadium at seventy. 5,000, whatever it is. There's rumours they might buy 90,000, uh, build it to 90,000. They'll fill it. They'll fill it. It's a monstrous institution. There you go. Let, let's put it that way. And not everyone can thrive in it. And I would include the manager in that as well. I don't think he's the right man for the job. I'm, I'm actually a fan of Ten Hag. I was when he was at Ajax. And I wanted him at West Ham for a considerable amount of time. And I think he did well at Man United last season. I think the Cristiano Ronaldo thing wasn't helpful. And his you know, first reign at the club. And it felt a little bit like it, Ronaldo was perhaps the issue, and you needed it was like player power, you know, get rid of this guy who's obviously a legend in football and probably might have felt I am better than you, I'm a better player than you are a manager, therefore I call the shots. And obviously he's gone, but yet the problem still remains the problems of whether it be things getting leaked to the press, which is obviously something Man United have had problems with for a period of time, whether it's now, you know, Jaden Sancho has had a very public fallout with the manager and there's obviously a lot of chat. There's other players unhappy under Ten Hag's regime and they're not happy about how he manages. And I, I'm not a Man U fan, so I don't know as much. If you're a Man U fan, I don't know as much as you here. So this is just outsider looking in. But I do wonder if he's maybe just got that old school thing about him, which is just being strict and perhaps the player's aren't happy with that or don't like being managed that way. And this is where the club need to decide, I think, whether to really back the manager. Because I think some managers you can back half-heartedly a little bit because there's no controversy. It's sort of like mm, the, the players are okay with him, he's okay with him, but we don't really need to take sides here. But it feels like at Man United, the board have to pick a side. Are they on the side of the manager or are they on the side of these players? Now, who those players are, just, obviously Sancho is one of them, we're not 100% sure. There will possibly be others. There's rumours that there's other players as well that isn't happy with Ten Hag. 
the club will be will know who they are, who's got grievances with how it's run, and this is where the board have to pick between those players or the manager. And it's a big call. Either way, it's a really big call to make because it's not like Sandro is cheap. We're talking about a player that costs tens of millions here, and it's still worth tens of millions plus some others. Um, it's a, I, I still like Ten Hag, and I still think he's a good manager. I just think Man United, is it too big for him? I'm not sure. I think some of the players perhaps are too modern for him, if that makes sense, in a way that it's like, no, nah, hang on a minute, we, we don't do this. We, we, we're a little bit more pampered than that. We don't like this strict routine. We don't like how you're trying to do things. Um, is, Ten, is Ten Hag too much of a dictatorship at that club? I'm not sure. Um, but one thing, what is sure is it needs fixed because they can't go every day. There's something happening. And Man United has been a circus since Fergie left. And it felt like last season, Ten Hag was starting to get under control a little bit post Ronaldo. But this season is just massively blowing up. And well, to put it this way, I think two of his more impressive players have been the two players he wanted rid of in the summer. Um, anyway, uh, quickly, predictions. Where do you think they're going to finish up this season? Will they get Champions League football? No. No, I don't think they'll get Champions League football. Uh seventh. Quite possibly, yeah, about seventh this season, I would I would I would imagine. Uh, listen, they may do big things in January. They may do big things in January. Uh they got a new guy in there. In fact, they probably will. So I would obviously change that. But um no, there's there's too many players I I, I don't like and I and I think are average and, and um that we know, but I'll tell you, he's a dictator. He's not a particularly good one because he's not dictated things particularly well. Um, there's too too many too many bad decisions in around that dressing room. Too many players um, been allowed to to get away with with a little bit too much. So um, yeah, I, I think they'll, they'll they won't do they won't they'll qualify for Europe, but they won't they will not trouble the Champions League places. No way. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is you could almost see them finishing fifth, so that would perhaps be an oh. additional Champions League spot, but it might not be because of them. Then Newcastle finishing bottom of the Champions League group has hindered England's coefficient in the rankings and currently the third rather than in the first two, which they have been previously. So now Man United might actually rely on Man City as well as Liverpool, West Ham, Brighton and Aston Villa going in in Arsenal, going and doing stuff in European football to get fifth in Champions League get Champions League to fifth in the Premier League where they might be is finishing up. I'm going to say no as well because at this point in time, I fancy Man City, Liverpool, Arsenal, Villa and Spurs to finish above them. So even yeah. if fifth was Champions League, I still think they'll miss out. Um, they'll need to do something drastic in the January transfer window. Players you admire? Uh, yeah, well, uh, Luke Shaw, uh, the striker. Well, really like him. Uh, Hoyland, Ras- Rasmus Hoyland. Yeah. Uh, Casemiro, I haven't seen him play the last few times. Um, so yeah, look, they got some, they got some good players there as as well. But they got some stinky old players as well. Let's let's be absolutely fair. I think Marcus Rashford has been completely overindulged at that club. Uh, last time I saw, I saw a Martial play. He was stood around doing nothing. Um, uh, Mason Mount, what the hell was all that about? Um, and making Bruno Fernandez captain. What you know, he's a Honestly, if you what you you what you want to do is infect by making captain, what you're saying is you either do one or two things. Either, either they instruct tactically really well, or they lead by example. Uh, you really want the captain to infect uh, the, rem- the rest of the players with their character. Well, I'd say if there's one thing you don't want to, one player you don't want to do that. It's uh, it's probably Bruno Fernandez, who's a whingy, whiny guy who I saw last season practically give up, asked to be taken off the pitch. So uh, look, uh, they got some um, they got some good players. A lot. Of, I, do you know what? Every time I've seen him, that that Garnacho um, has shown himself to have some ability as well. I, I I am aware that he's played poorly on times, but I, I haven't particularly uh, seen those. But a um, lot of journeymen in that squad as well. It's uh, they they are as far as far as concerns comparing those with some of the other bigger teams. That they that's a massive fall from grace. That is not what I would consider to be a, a man united squad. I'm not look I think any of the top you look at look at Bayern Munich who they played recently, so pace and in endeavor and and um so sharp and so clinical. Um honestly it's like I look at Man U sometimes, it looks like a retirement village, quite frankly. So yeah, I I'm, I don't don't admire too many of their players, no. 
Um, I really like Varane, big fan of him. Don't know why he doesn't get played as often as he should do. Again, he's probably one of the ones that's maybe fell out with Chen Han, but I think he's a class centre-back when he plays. I'm a huge fan of Luke Shaw. I'm probably one of the biggest fans of Luke Shaw. I still think he's world-class. Whenever we do a Man U preview and I say that, I always get grief. I stick, stick by it. I think he's world-class. I don't think there's that many better left-backs out there in European football that I'm aware of. That's better than him. I think he's really good going forward. He's quite quick for his size, defensively sound. And under 10, he's been playing centre-back and performing really well at centre-back as well. I think he's such a fantastic footballer. Amrabat's been a horrific signing for them. I thought he was one player that I would have minded at West Ham. Um, obviously, he was really good in the Conference League final against us as well. But he's gone there and been a bit slow to get into the team. He has played he's fat uh, as well. Have you seen him? He is a bit chunky, isn't he? Yeah. Um, played a full-back. Looks like he's ate a full-back. Um, but doesn't... A big one. Hasn't played particularly well. Casemiro's fallen off a cliff this season too. I agree with you about Ganacho. A lot of potential there. Martial's only good for wearing gloves. Um, Hoyland, no goals or assistance rocking up. And he looked like a good signing. I'd, I'd only seen glimpses of him because he played in Italy. So I hadn't seen that much about him. But I'd heard a lot of rave reviews about him as well. And I was excited to see him arrive in the Premier League. And now, there's a long way to go. He's still young, and I'm sure he'll come good. But at the minute, it's been a pretty poor start. Like you said, Mason Mount, Ten Hag's number one target in the summer. They went and got him, and, well, everyone stood around looking, thinking, what was the, what was the point? What we bought? What Where were you going to play him? Next, behind Fernandez, Next to Fernandez, What's going on? And it's just a lot of head scratching going on. And um, I'm going to round it off with a mention from my man, Scott McTominay, in the goals. He's still not the best player in the world, but I still really like him. I'm a big fan of McTominay. always have been. But I appreciate and accept I'm a little bit biased. Anyway, um, shall we go from Man U to talking about flu? Absolutely. The team news for West Ham, despite four weeks ago, David Moyes saying Mikel Antonio will be out for two weeks. He remains out. Aguirre and Cooney missed the humbling at Anfield uh, with the flu. For this preview, we're going to include them. We're going to imagine they're over their sniffles and they're available for selection. But apart from Mikel Antonio, everybody else is available to be selected, Gonzo. Um, right then, this should be interesting. Who would you like to see in the sticks? Because obviously Fabianski's been playing well. Ariola came back in against Liverpool. Didn't necessarily have a bad game. He just picked the ball out of the net five times. Um, who would you like to see start against Manu? I'll put Fabianski in there. I, I don't think Manu are going to necessarily come at us. I do think... There was a really good opportunity in, in Liverpool where Ariola not only caught the ball, made the save, it, it was gone. It was distributed for us to try and count. It didn't work out because we were crap. But within within a second, he caught the ball and given it so sharp in a way he thinks about us counter-attacking. We were not about to play one of those teams. So um, he's just conceded five goals. And then Fabianski just had back-to-back clean sheets. So I put Fabianski between the sticks. Yeah, really good form, Fabianski, isn't he? It's not clean sheets, because, well, it is because of the defensive performance as well, but he's also been chipping in with crucial saves, contributing to those clean sheets. So, Fabianski, for me, your defence? Um, look, I mean, this this is this is a bit tough on, on right back. I'm not going to get away with, with playing nobody that got would have been sort of mentally scarred by the mauling at Liverpool. So Soufal's going to have to play at, at right back. And under normal circumstances, a bigger squad, I'd have sort of left him out and say, man, you've had a really tough old uh, tough old night there up, at, up in Merseyside. I'm going to give you the... Um... Well, I wonder if we get a couple of days off again, the West Ham players, after the, the 5-0 loss against Fulham. Um, so it would have to be Soufal, uh, but reluctantly. And then uh, Zuma, Gerd and Emerson. Yeah, I agree. I think Zoom uh, Sufal sorry, has been in decent nick um, in the last few games. I do worry about him coming up against Garnacho because he can struggle against the direct wingers mm. sometimes. But what's the alternative? Ben Johnson. And I'm not adverse to it completely because I thought he did OK at Anfield. He's one of the few players that came away with an all right performance behind him. But A, it was at left back, not right back. And B, it wasn't good enough to push so far out the team. It's not like he was fantastic. He was just better than the rest who were crap. Um, so, yeah, the rest of them picked themselves, really, with Zuma, Gerrard, because Mavapanos had a chance against Liverpool. He wasn't the worst player in the pitch, but he didn't do anything that says, hey, get Zuma out of the team. And a Gerrard and Emerson walk back into it, really. Moving into midfield, what would you like to see happening in there? 
Uh, but dropping Thomas Suchek, you can't play like that. That's a wrong messaging to, to play like he played and then say you get to play in the next game. The, the messaging is quite opposite from that. You don't get to play like that and then get selected for the next game. That, that, those are just, you know, those are the not rules are not only the manager. Those are the rules of the club. You don't do that. Although if you listen to our player ratings, I don't overly necess- I, I do blame the manager for a lot of what went on against Liverpool. That being said, I, either he was completely and utterly bloody useless and deserves to be dropped, or he was so knackered that he gave up chasing his men and he, he wasn't able to, um, in which case he needs to be rested. So either one means Thomas Suchek out of the team. Uh, I'll play Ward Prowse there uh, next to Alvarez in, cent- in the, the central areas, if you want. Um, and I'll play Lucas Pakatar as the attacking midfielder. I completely agree with all everything you've just said there. Suchek has to come out of the side. And because of lack of options, there's not really anything you can do otherwise than drop James ward Pouse back in there. I would like to see ward Pouse retain his sort of attacking position because he's been working alongside Jared Bowen and it has yielded two wins for us. But if you take Suchek out, who goes in? If you were to leave James ward Pouse further forward, who, who goes in there? I generally think the answer would have to be Lewis Orford. Mm. In terms of who's compatible to play next to Edson Alvarez, no Connor commentary is there, but I'm not seeing anything from Con. Mm. I know he scored a really good goal against Crystal Palace, but it doesn't. I, I'm not bringing Connor commentary in because he scored a, a banger, but I don't want to see Orford play this game. I, mean, I hope he's got a future at West Ham, but you can't put him in at home to Man United and say, "Go on and get on with it." Have him on the bench maybe, but put him in from the start. I think it'd be a bit much, but this is where. Possibly in previous games, him coming off the bench for five minutes or something might have allowed you to have him as an option. But we just don't have options for centre midfield, and to spend that much money and have this many senior players at the squad and at the club, and generally not have an alternative to centre mid is just a bit. It's a bit yeah. embarrassing, really. So, but so Ward Pouse has to drop back and forth. I don't want to, but I think he has to, and I agree with you. So therefore, who replaces Ward Pouse? Well, has got to be Paquetta again. There's no one else. There's no other options. I think I can guess your other three. Can you? Go on, then. Well, you're going to see Caduce on the right. Well, you're going to agree or not. You know, I am. Oh, you... sorry. I thought he was going to do the whole three. I, I was yeah, waiting well, for three. One by one. Oh, well, that's not the, that's not the same as naming the three. You're just naming three. one. Go on, name the three. All oh, right, mister. In, in the last preview, you read out your team in one go, and now you're dragging it out as long as you can. Right, so... <laughs> Bowing up front. Yeah. Okay. Kearney on the left. Yeah, well, yes and no. Um, that those, I'm not sure whether. Wait, it's... hang on. What do you mean, yes or no? It's either you'd like to see no, Kearney start. No, 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 I want Kearney. To... No, 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 no. Um, there's there's more fluidity to it than that. I would really like to see Kearney and Bowen swap in positions. We have a little glimmer every time I see Bowen operate on that left hand side. He impresses me. Be it an early cross, the left, the left foot. His right foot's getting better. All right, I know he was playing up front for the game against Liverpool, but the ball came down that channel. He cut in. He's a threat. Um, and because of the pressing of James Ward Prowse, I feel almost Bowen would be better at, at doing that than maybe Cornet would. Cornet gives us the outright pace, so I'd definitely be telling them to swap and move over. I mean, the other thing with Cornet is I, I feel that if the three, do you know what? You can make this about three players or five players. Let me name the five players Pablo Fornells, Side Ben Rama, Maxwell Cornet, Danny Ings, uh, Divine Mabama. If you want to make it five, my example would be three, which would be um, which would be the Ings, Mubama, and Cornet. Out of, th- out of those three that have been given an opportunity, small, tiny little little glimmer, little glimpse to do something as as sub- really late substitutes, the only one that's done anything is Cornet. The only one. Mubama did against Burnley. He was okay, uh, but you know, it, it was it wasn't electric like Cornet wasn't getting the assist and that sort of thing. So I, I think if if what you're going to say is, and I think if you were to ask David Moyes, do you treat everybody fairly? Do you treat everybody evenly? Does everyone have a fair chance under you? I don't believe any of those things are true, right? But I think if you were to ask David Moyes, he would say, yeah, but naturally, of course, of course, I'm a fair fair man. And um, so I think with that in mind, Cornet has done the best when given the chance. So I think somebody, something has to go. Someone has to start. You cannot be doing four nails or putting Ben Rahman there. There has to be some consequence to, to what we've seen. 
um, and there's this palming it, palming off the blame on on people that might have requested rotation, is is a is a a rat move. Quite frankly, it's a rat move. It really is. Somebody has to take responsibility, and ideally, it's David Moyes for his decisions. And after that, you have to try and select some players from within this this shattered group that you've created, and. And I just don't think after that performance you can choose either Fournells or you can choose Ben Rama. Suchek, we've already discussed. I, I, it's almost a case of last man standing, Geo. Not because anyone has excelled, not because anyone has been brilliant, but the last that the player probably least mortally wounded by by the, the, the debacle that we saw at Anfield, and probably the person would probably come in and be most sharpest and give Man U most problems would probably be Maxwell Cornet. But it, it's not a not because he's done anything amazing. I've got the same fun three as Gonzo, so we've got the exact same eleven um, for this one, Gonzo. I also agree with the reasons you've said, but also to use David Moyes' own words against him, post-Liverpool, he said, well, we're missing some boys for the African nation, so some of these players are going to have to step up. Well, Ben Ram and Fanals, in his eyes, not in mine, but in Moyes' eyes, have had an opportunity. They didn't take it. It's Kone's opportunity. Now, you've got yeah. to give him a chance now to step up. Now, obviously, there's a the counter argument to me would be, well, he could go to Africa. Okay, if I, I don't think he will, but if I accept that, I could throw back. Well, Ben Rama could also go to the African Nations as well, but we still give him an opportunity at Anfield. And last man standing, it's it's a horrific but accurate way of summing up the situation we're in here. Who would you like to see start against Man U at home? Uh, the, the one guy that's not dreadful. Can we have him, yes. please? Um, anyway, I've got a question for you guys at home. Well, I've got two. First of all, who would you like to see start? Let us know in the comments below. But I've got a second. Well, it's actually six, but it's one big question. What do you think the score will be as West Ham take on Man United? What about Northern Forest? Um, obviously, with Nuno in charge now at home to Bournemouth. Luton United. Uh, Luton United. Luton Town against Newcastle United. You can see where I went wrong there. Luton at home to Newcastle. Newcastle not great away from home. Luton uh, doing, doing all right, picking up a few performances and results here. Fulham host Burnley. What do you reckon the score is going to be? Uh, we've got Spurs at home to Everton. And then on Saturday evening, we've got the big one, Liverpool taking on Arsenal. What do you think the score is going to be? Now, if you think I can get all six of them right, then brilliant. We've got just the app for you because if you get all them right, you can win a share of a £2 million jackpot with BetMGM. It's free to download and it's free to sign up. Now, it is a gambling app, so you need to be 18 plus and please do gamble responsibly. But you do not need to deposit any money in order to play this game. It's called Golden Goals. So when you download the app and you sign up, it's on the bottom tab called Golden Goals. Just click on it. You insert your six score predictions. And then just like other games that's of similar nature, you, you need to get the correct score as well as the correct result. And there is a £5,000 jackpot every weekend. So if you get three right out of the six, you're probably, don't hold me to this, but you're probably going to win a share of the money. A few weeks ago, there was only two people, so they got two and a half grand each for getting three correct scores out of their six predictions. Use the link in the description below. It's very important you use that link. Get it downloaded today, free to download, free to sign up. Play Golden Goals and see how you get on. I'm in, Gonzo's in, but if you do deposit money, deposit a tenner, get £40 of free bets, but that's not what we're promoting. What we're promoting is Golden Goals, free to play. Gonzo. Um, a certain man in Dugga has put himself under a bit of pressure for this game. Oh yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. You know, gone, gone to the front, and you know, bit of bring it. You know, he's, yeah, he's gone to the front. Bring it on. Come on in. Let's have some of that. So um, yeah, he's he's. I said, not even paint the target on his back. He's he stood out there and robustly said, "I'm, I'm the man. I, I know best. I know best." So uh, yeah, well. well <laughs> There's not an awful lot you you can say you can say that. I've seen this before I've seen it before I've seen it with, I've seen it before Kenny Dalgleish at Liverpool I've seen it before with a uh, Pearson at Leicester I've seen when managers go this way but I've seen it with Allardyce actually as well so um, yeah uh, look uh, you, you can be aggressive um, can be aggressive if you want and call out and, and suggest not the first time he suggested the fans don't know what they're talking about can be aggressive towards the the press if you want I'd suggest. Um, it's not a particularly prudent course of action. So um, the tr the trouble is, I, I, I'm actually all for creating sometimes a siege mentality at a club, but club is is the word. So when the thing happened with Everton, gave Sean Dyche a real 
a, a real ability to turn around and say the world, the Premier League's against us, the world's against us. You know, come on, boys, let's get, let's get, let's show them what's what. You know, we're Everton Football Club. It gives you almost an an ability to do a rousing, rallying war cry. Uh, David Moyes has done nothing more than say the world is against me, uh, and it's the wrong message, and it's a bad message. And if he's asking for the the team to pick that up, then they're, they're not going to be resonating with that because a lot of the team were part of uh, a lot of the criticism. A lot of the team would have been the victims of what David Moyes chose to do against Liverpool. A lot of the team, a lot of the, t- well, a lot of the squad are not, are not playing. Um, there, there are, there are possibly 11 players that that might resonate with. Um, but there's going to be another 13 or so who is, is rallying cry won't resonate with. So it's, um, it's a weird old preparation for the man U game really. Are you confident? No. Optimistic? No. Why not? Um, well, well, because uh, because of what he said in his the way he sort of lauded Liverpool and they just oh, they, you know just what a, what an amazing team they are they're just better levels better or whatever it was that he said. And what you saw then was a little glimmer into his psyche and why his record against the Sky Sports top six is so poor over time. Because we've played Man United before. As we've, we've said at the start of this video, Man United have been patchy since Sir Alec left. And they have been. There have been times where we've played Man United and they've been crap, yet we still fear them. Honestly, and still David Moyes approaches them like he's facing Skulls and Keane in midfield and, and so on. And you know, Where's the badge, not the team. He exactly does that. Um, and, and not just Man United, but we'll talk about them. Um. I don't even think he he necessarily believes in his rotation. He spoke about the rotation. He very much indicated, I rotated. That's what you asked for. That's what you are. It reminds me of someone else. I'll deal with this in a separate video, right? But it was. It felt like the rotation wasn't something he wanted to do. That was a punishment. And um, and if I don't feel he wants to do it, then how can we really have any faith that he had some tactical plan to rotate and make things good? For Man United, he hasn't instilled confidence. Do I think it's all of that? No, I don't. But but with his this this is the thing: you're responsible for your own words. You're responsible for the messaging that goes out there. There's a press conference is there for two reasons. A press conference is there because he's contractually obliged to. And when people like Sky pay really good money to the Premier League, they do so in the expectation of getting content. That content isn't just the games themselves. They need to be able to fill up uh, Sky Sports News with interviews from managers and stuff like that. That's the first thing it does, that the press conference. It gives people content. The second thing a press conference does is gives a manager the means to communicate with their fan base. Well, he's done that and he's done it badly. And unfortunately, the net result of that is that he has... He's not made me confident. Not, not the net result, but for me, it's made me not confident about this game at all. I'm quite optimistic, actually. Yeah, because I obviously have said my piece. I don't like how he went about the Liverpool game. But I always feared that's what he was going to do when we saw that lineup against Wolves. Part of me, well, I was excited for those guys. Part of, there was a little bit, was a, I know it's coming midweek yeah, yeah. now. But he he did that with one eye on this game. I think he did it thinking I need to get a result against Man U and need to make sure the Premier League's okay. And I don't I don't like it, nor do I agree with it. But I think this is his mentality. I think he's prioritised this fixture over that at Anfield. And whilst his away record is stinking, I think at home we have at least been competitive with the Sky Sports top six. And he's picked up results against some of them as well. So I do think we've got reason for hope. It's, it's my optimism on the day, or should I say my confidence on the day, will be decided at 11.30 when that lineup comes out. And I want to see a bloody... If I see Suchek in there, I'm just going to... If, if I see Suchek's come out, but it's Danny Ings that's going on, gone in and we've moved Bowen around or something, it's, oh, I'm just going to... My, my faith will disappear pretty quick. But if he gets the lineup correct, we can win this game. Now, Man United results look okay, but it's exactly the same as us. Some of them, they've been quite lucky. It, it feels unsustainable. And last time I said that to you, Bournemouth went and thumped them at Old Trafford. So I'm saying that again, hoping that um, the same thing happens twice. But I think, man, you were there to be got at. They were impressive against Liverpool. But they defended their 18-yarder. You can't, they're not going to be able to do that against us. They're going to have to come out and attack. The onus is going to be on them to attack us. And I think that plays into our hands. I think Caduce will have space. I think Bowen will have space. I think Paqueta will 
roam around and he might... I feel Man you're quite weak in the middle of the pitch, the centre midfield area, whatever the makeup is. And I could not care whether it's Casemiro, Amrabat, McTominay, Maynou, Eriksen, Mount. I could not care who it was he puts in the middle. I still think there's an opportunity for us to have Alvarez, Ward, Pass and Paqueta in there. And Man United fans will disagree with this. That's fine. They're Man U fans. They're supposed to. But West Ham fans, which three would you like to have? Would you like to have Alvarez, Ward, Pass and Paqueta? Or would you like any of those three? You, you make up your combination of that. Mid- you can pick your three favourite Man U midfielders out of that lot. Which would you prefer? I think West Ham fans would say, actually, I'll have my lot, please. I'm happy. I'm, I prefer what we've got. We're biased. Of course we are. We can win on Saturday, and he bloody needs to. I still won't be happy with how he approached Liverpool. Even if he wins, you'll say, look, I'm right. I I did the right thing. I'd still say, well, no. I would have preferred to have won the Liverpool one than the man you were. Now, granted, if we went full strength against Liverpool, it doesn't mean we would have won, but it would have been a hell of a lot more competitive, that's for sure. But he needs to win. He needs to. He did this against Olympiacos away. We lost the following game against Everton. I remember in his it, might, it was his first tenure. He did it away to Arsenal in the quarterfinal of the League Cup. He threw it. Yeah, we played Newcastle the following weekend. We we lost, and it was like, well, what was the point in that then? It's a dangerous, dangerous thing to do to throw the cup competitions to a club, to a fan base that. Well, we we won a trophy for the first time in forty three years. So when you're discarding silverware or the possibility of silverware like that. I think that's a bloody dangerous thing to do. He's like you said, he's painted a target on his back, and the only way he removes it for now, some people won't let him. But for, for the only way he gets away with it to some extent is by winning on Saturday. Nothing else will do. Can I get any final words in your own important for score prediction, please? Yeah, I just, just a little bit more of the same. Really, it's very very hard to, to come off the back of a result like that and have confidence. And and you know what? That's I guess it is the fickle nature of football, but it's it's also to be expected. You know, it's stuff like that's going to dent your confidence in the same way that you you get confident after the Wolves game. You know, you think, oh, in a second, maybe we can go to Anfield and get something. So I, certainly, I went into that game thinking we could get something because we played well in the, in the couple of games preceding that. No, we haven't. That, that was atrocious. So it's, it's dented my confidence for this. There's no doubt about it at all. Um, and you're absolutely right. And all I'd do is I'd add the Everton the Everton away cup game to that little list you made as well. He does not have a good record. But I can't recall if we won the following league game. I, I, think, I, think, we, I think we lost because I, I ranted about it. But I, I, I but are you, well, even, even if we're, we're out by a game, what you say is, is correct. I, I, he is not good at doing, at doing this. And, and for that reason, and I, I don't know what it is. Maybe, just maybe, the benefit that he gets in maybe some fresher players is completely offset by the negative energy that he gets from pissing people off. Um, and by, you know, by. Well, the player's confidence as well. Any high the player had after Wolves is probably gone now. This is my point. And, 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 you know, irrespective of whether these players are playing, you'd, you'd be pretty down if you were, Angelo Bonner, if you were Saibem Rama, Pablo Fornells, you're going to be pretty down. Well, you're in and around the first team squad, and it's going to be hard to walk into training or with a with a smile on your face. So I do wonder if if one is off, offset by the other. Um, you're not bouncing in, not bouncing into work on Saturday, ready to play Manu. Um, I'm not confident. I'm going to go with a one-one, which is a bit of a cop-out prediction, but uh, yeah, that's, that's all I've got. I'm afraid. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. I mean, you look at Paqueta, when it was 1-0 and he was stripped and ready to come on, I've never seen a player warm up so quick and be ready so fast and come on so quick under David Moyes, but he was warming up with his kit and bib on. You know, he was eager. But when he came on, even though they scored, he was still, I got this aura of confidence from Paqueta. He was a peacock with his feathers on show, but every minute it went by, it was almost like someone plucked a feather out of him. By the end of it, he looked like the turkey that sat in my fridge at the minute, ready for Monday morning. Mm-hmm. And it, it will dent people. You call it the fickle nature. I just call it the honest nature of football. Mm. We win, my confidence goes up, but that's because players' confidence goes up. So why would you? Why would there not be a correlation between fans' confidence when you, in performances and form and results and player form? I, I I never understood why it's called fickle. Like, but like I always said, I'd rather be fickle than stubborn. Mm. I'd rather be willing to change my mind and to stick with my idea and just refuse to see anything else. But. I'm optimistic. This this is a fixture, and maybe it's just because this is the 
after Spurs away, Man U at home, that's a fixture I want to win every season. So maybe that's playing its part. But you know something? I don't care. And I'm not going to apologise for it because if you can't look forward to certain games, then what's the point of being a football fan? Um, I'm buzzing for Saturday. I'm really looking forward to it. And I think we're going to win 2-1, Gonzo. I think, I think it's going to be a good game. We're going to get a good win. And we will be minimum seventh in the Premier League on Christmas Day. Well, that would be a fantastic position. Yeah, to be yes, in. it would. Yes, it would. Anyway, we're going to leave it there. Please get involved in the comments. If you've enjoyed this preview, do drop a like on it by clicking thumbs up. Helps out this video, helps out the channel. Scourge, you down as chat myself and Gonzo. Catch up with you in a bit. Mm -hmm.